Welcome to the Quiet of the Night podcast. Currently a Repairman Jack review and discussion podcast. I am your host, Gillian. And tonight, I am talking about the first Repairman Jack book, The Tomb. Okay, so first up, let's. I'm going to start with a short, uh, spoiler-free review of the book. And then I'll move into a discussion of... Uh, actual plot points with spoilers. So, The Tomb is not my favorite Repairman Jack book. I can't quite say which one is my favorite one right now, because it has been a while since I read them. Although I do know that I like at least one book more than this one. Uh, This book does have a lot going for it, though. It is the first book, so it has a lot of the character. Yeah, you know, it builds the character of Jack and you know his supporting cast of Abe, Vicky, and Gia very well, in my opinion. Um, but because it is a first book, because it is the first book and a standalone, it doesn't have the same hooks into the larger story of the secret history of the world that later books have. So it isn't as connected to the rest of the, you know, meta story. And it, so it does, it does lose out a little bit on that front. It is a good supernatural horror thriller with a smart protagonist. Jack wins throughout the novel, mostly because he makes smart, intelligent decisions, mostly. As I, as we go through the books, I'm going to rank them uh, comparatively. So for now, we have I am placing the tomb as the only book at in the number one spot, but it will quickly be moved down uh, next month, at the very least, and we'll see how it goes from there. Um, Okay, so on to the discussion with uh, actual spoilers. Uh, So I hope you've read the book before, because I am going to talk spoilers. I'm not going to plot by um, uh, point by point dissect the book, but I am going to talk about in general and a little in depth in certain points of the book. Book discussion... Spoilers begin now. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about about the fixes that Jack does in the novel. So he does. There are four fixes described throughout the throughout the novel. The first one that Jack receives is uh, to investigate Grace Westphalian's disappearance by Gia, which that is actually. I was surprised by how early that that was introduced. It, it has been a while since I read the book. I thought that that came after finding um, Kasum's grandmother, quote-unquote grandmother's necklace. But it comes before. Um, well, yeah. You know, just jump, the story just jumps right into Jack and, and Gia's relationship, which I think is a good, you know... It's, it's good uh, momentum for the story. Um, so that's like the first case that he gets. He doesn't solve that case. And actually, partway through the novel, uh, after he has the uh, laxative analyzed, he kind of runs out of clues for like two days, you know, in story, which kind of... Uh, for for me anyway, it kind of slowed down the story. Yeah, it just felt like there's this period in the middle of the book where Jack is just waiting for something to happen. Uh, later books ha- usually have a secondary fix that he's working on throughout the novel, so that he's still doing something even if he's waiting. This first novel lacks that. I'm not saying that it's badly written. But it's just a weird narrative choice for the characters to have 
for an investigative character like Jack to suddenly have no leads um, for a couple days. And once he does get a lead, he makes the connection between, you know, Kusum and the laxative and the necklace and the creature that is like been appearing at his house the last couple of days. Once he makes that connection, he starts investigating again and, you know, he finds the, he finds the Rikoshi. He pretty much figures out almost everything. Second uh, job that he gets to in the novel is from Kasum to find his quote unquote grandmother's necklace, which Jack does actually complete very quickly within one night, well, within, within a day in story. And he does it, I think, um, cross dressing as the woman, as an older woman to like bait the mugger. Maybe not necessary. But, you know, he does find and recognize the guy based on his scratched eye, you know, showing that he's observant of the people around him. You know, in the novel, he actually walks past the guy without realizing, consciously realizing that he saw, you know, the, the scratched eye. Uh, let's see, and then there are two flashback uh, fixes that he does. The first one is his first fix, where to keep a uh, neighborhood... Uh, teenagers from driving through his neighbor's yard. He installs like a um, pipes filled with concrete behind uh, like bushes, so that when they try it again, they just total their vehicles. And then the fourth fix described in the novel is him finding and killing, you know, his mother's killer, which. I actually really enjoyed that section of the uh, of the um, book, where he has first the flashback of her death on the way into Jersey, into New Jersey to uh, see his father and play tennis. Uh, which that is a it. I enjoy this section, but it's also weird because in later books he's much more distant from his father, and so the idea of um. Of Jack going to New Jersey to play tennis is just it's a little uh it's a little strange, but I still like it uh yeah he get he goes and plays tennis and they have you know he has an almost uh he you know we see his strained relationship with his father, and on the way back he has the other flashback of his mother's death becoming an unsolved crime. Basically because the police, you know, either won't or can't devote the resources to, you know, track down a, you know, seemingly random act of violence. And so Jack takes it upon himself to find, you know, this person, which he does. And then he fixes the situation, you know, in, in a somewhat gruesome manner by hanging the man from the bridge and letting, you know, 18 wheelers, you know, semi trucks repeatedly hit and, you know, bludgeon him. And then he kind of, he has another like year or semester in college before he kind of checks out from life and tries to disappear into New York city. Although the fact that he's still coming back to Jersey to play tennis with his father kind of says he's not as checked out as he wants to be. You know, as I, as I said, in later books, he's much more estranged from his family and father especially. So those are the four fixes that Jack did throughout the novel with a 75% completion rate. Uh, I don't consider... While he did eliminate the threat that was going after the Westphalians, he didn't find um, Grace or Nellie alive. So it's a little bit of a failure on that one. Um, I mentioned that I like that he's a smart, intelligent you know, character. And I think where this is most showcased 
is in the fight with uh, the mother Rakosh, where he is completely physically outmatched, but he still manages manages to kill her. He does it by outthinking her. You know, after running up three flights of stairs and across the uh, across the roof, he tricks her into running off the roof, and then when when she's climbing back up, he spears her with the broken flagpole and then uses you know diesel diesel oil to set her on fire you know throughout all of it he cannot win a stand out a stand up fight against the rakosh so he has to trick her and you know it's it's a good it's a good fight good little bit of, it's a good action set piece i think it's like the stand out action piece because I've heard F. Paul Wilson say that, that that rooftop fight was like, that was the first thing that he had imagined in the novel. And so he kind of built the rest of the novel around it. As I said, Jack usually makes smart decisions. Uh, like the one glaring example of a bad decision is right after he gets uh, Gia and Vicky out of Nelly and Grace's townhouse and stashes them in Abe's daughter's apartment. He spends the afternoon with uh, Gia and Vicky cleaning the apartment. Um, he leaves with just a few hours of before dark to go and find Kolobate and does find her just in time to be uh, locked into the ship with her by Kusum. You know, if he had just gone earlier, you know, earlier in the day, a couple hours earlier, he would have completely, he would have been able to get her out of there easily. I realize that this is, you know, this is part of the story. He has to get locked in so that they have to go through the, the bottom, through the uh, Rikoshi nest, you know, so that you can have the revelations of, you know, these are, not normal Rakosh and you know you get the horrible realization of what Kasum has done in order to create the nest uh, but it just feels a little like you know he could have gone earlier and there's there was nothing stopping him from going earlier you know he had Vicky and and Gia stashed in a safe place you know he could have just gone right away to find, you know, Kolobate. And, yeah. So that's just one point that I think, you know, Jack sometimes doesn't always make the best decisions. You know, he, I guess, you know, in story, you can convince, I can convince myself that he just got caught up in the moment of, you know, being with Gia and Vicky in a nice, happy, you know, family domestic situation. Jack would say he is a loner, that he wants, that, you know, he doesn't need anyone, but he very much does need, you know, his friends and, and, you know, Gia especially, you know, there's a, early in the book, uh, Jack actually says that he wants to be Vicky's father, which actually took me by surprise. It feels a, um, I don't know if he, well, I guess... He probably meant in a figurative sense, because legally he doesn't have a he doesn't have a legal identity that he could, you know, marry Gia with to become a become Vicky's daughter officially. Uh, but yeah, it did kind of surprise me that you know he was just blurted out, "I want to be her father," or you know, I you know I thought that I might want to be her father. I, I forget his exact words. <sighs> Okay, so I've convinced myself that that scene isn't that, yeah, that scene isn't as bad as it is, but still, you gotta make sure you take care of things when you gotta take care of them. Okay, oh, I wanted to bring up the fact that I read the nineteen eighty four version, but I did I do have a ebook of of the two thousand six version, which is the the final version that was comp that was published under the name um, Rikoshi. And there's not a lot of differences. 
one of the main differences is just like I said in technology. I've, I said that in like the previous podcast. In the eighty four version, he's watching he's watching a Betamax tape on his projector TV. In the two thousand six, it's a DVD. In the ninety eight version, it was a laser disc. And then there's changes to certain like references to time, like it. Uh, at one point in the '84 version, he talks about he was he was buying gold in the '70s. Um, in the updated version, there's no date given as to when he started buying gold, and and some of the details about like the price fluctuations have been taken out. Uh, one kind of mm, it's not a big change, but it's more like a framing. In that uh, in the old version, Jack goes for a little walk around Times Square. Which in the eighties was uh, Slee's Town, USA, as he as he says, just X-rated movie theaters, uh, grindhouse theaters, uh, sex workers, just you know, basically not a place you would take your family, not a tourist destination. And then in the nineties, the area was cleaned up and uh, sanitized. There was a project by the mayor, I think. I'm not, I don't remember. I don't know the specifics. Um, and so in later versions, he talks about how it's framed within the, the, the quote unquote depravity of the old is framed as, you know, a bygone era. In the 80 version, in the 84 version, you know, he, there are answer phones instead of answering machines. Uh, he, he calls from a payphone at, at a couple a couple times. In the uh, 2006 version, he has a track phone. I don't know if anyone remembers track phones. They were cheap, uh, prepaid cell phones that you could buy from like the, the gas station. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, he has that in the 2006 version and oh and in the 2006 version there's a reference to someone uh listening to music on an ipod uh yeah, and there's there's some more like scattered changes but those are like the ones that stood out to me oh one odd thing i found well not odd but interesting thing i found is that the name kusum it is a, a well according to the uh, baby name, uh, the baby name website that I found, it is a girl's name, even though it is used as a man's name in the book, and it means flower. I don't know if there's a reason for that, but it might just have been author error. Maybe there's been some drift in the uh, gendering of that name over time. That I don't know about that uh, Wilson does. I don't know. Just something that I found interesting. Okay, I was just looking over my notes. And I forgot to mention the character of Julio. Um, earlier when I was mentioning uh, Jack's, like, the core characters. I completely forgot about Julio. Julio, the bartender of Julio's Bar, is, like, a staple of the Repairman Jack novels. And he appears here, you know, fully formed. And there's not too much to his character, but, you know, we, we just get the little bit about, you know, him, uh, about his uh, overuse of cologne and, you know, his uh, muscular physique. But, you know, I've always, I've always had a soft spot for Julio. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's just the... Latin heritage or something. Oh, yeah, I spoke about how there's that, uh, like, lull in action in the middle where Jack has no uh, leads to follow, and he's just kind of waiting around. And during that point, during that part of the story, is still there's still the flashbacks of Arthur Westphalen, which I think is supposed to maintain the momentum of the story. You know, and I did, I do like the flashbacks. They're short, 
you know, quick bits of, you know, leading up to, you know, the, the inciting incident of the entire novel, you know, the, the destruction of the temple in the hills. But it does feel like a separate story that was just kind of like cut up and stuck in between, you know, the current novel. So it, it, it doesn't feel, you know, while it does maintain action in the story, in the novel, in the main story, like I said, Jack just kind of waits around for a couple days. Uh, so this being the first book, it doesn't have a lot of connections to other books. It is referenced in later books, but there isn't much from this book connected directly to other books. It is the second standalone novel that was incorporated into the adversary cycle. The supernatural weirdness of this book, the Ro Rokoshi, are suitably monstrous. As described in the book, they are humans, like uh, twisted human forms. I always imagine them as, because like, they describe the head as being like shark-like, but with like a a shorter snout and then like muscular bodies and kind of uh black dark as night skin i always imagine them as this is gonna sound silly but i always imagine them as kind of looking like the street sharks but just like a little bit more leaner and kind of like hunched with black black skin so maybe they they weren't quite as evil looking in my head. They were menacing, not necessarily totally monstrous to in my mind. The name of these creatures is from uh, Hindu, from the Hindu religion. But the actual creature in the well in the histories is quite a bit different than what's described in the book and I'm actually going to spend my special topic episode in two weeks talking about the actual creature demon the in uh, Hindu folk folklore I want to talk briefly about the end of this novel which it ends on a cliffhanger where Jack is apparently at death's door hearing a phone ring hoping that someone's going to come and save him uh, spoiler alert he does get saved and there are 15 more books <laughs> um, but yeah so that's another oddity about this book is that you know it ends on that cliffhanger later books I think they do have some uh, elements that don't quite resolve neatly at every end but they don't have quite this level of a cliffhanger. Yeah, so we'll very quickly find out how he was saved in the beginning of the next book. One more thing. A frequent but minor element of the Repairman Jack novels is the, the private film festivals that Jack organizes for himself. In this first novel, he watches movies directed by James Well, including Frankenstein, The Bride of Frankenstein, and The Invisible Man. He also watches The Hunchback of Notre Dame, although that movie was directed by William Dieterle, although it shares a it shares a main character with another James Well movie, The Old Dark House. These movies share some thematic elements with the story told within the tomb. Kasum is sort of a Frankenstein type character within the tomb who has created monsters and has kind of lost his mind. Um, in The Invisible Man, the formula that allows the main character to become invisible also causes him to go crazy and go on a murderous rampage. In the very beginning of the book, while putting away the Frankenstein tape, Jack says he thinks, poor Henry Frankenstein. Despite everyone around him, he thought he was sane. 
which is also a sentiment I think he later applies to Kasum, who is who believes that everything he is doing is to purify his karma. He can't quite break out of the mindset of, you know, redeeming himself. And part of the reason he wants to redeem himself is because of breaking his vows of celibacy, which he broke because of his sister, which he broke through it broke because of his sister. And throughout the novel, he has moments of temptation when he's around her, which is similar to the lust that Frollo felt for Elsmerelda in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. There's probably more allusions in the novel to the to these films, but I I was not able to find copies of these films to watch. Uh, perhaps I'll be able to do that for the next book. The Repairman Jack Film Festivals are a recurring element, and so I will be listing them and giving a little bit of discussion here at the end of the uh, podcast. So, in two weeks, I will be back with my special topic episode on the Rikoshi. Uh, well, the actual Hindu folklore version. And then two weeks after that, I will be back with a review discussion of Legacies. Legacies, I will give a uh, content warning for child abuse and pedophilia. While neither are vividly described, they are mentioned in major plot points. Uh, just to be warned on that. Legacies was the first Repairman Jack book that I read. I believe, if, I'm, if I can remember this correctly, my local library had all of the adversary psycho books except for the tomb. So I read, you know, the keep... The Touch, Reborn, Reprisal, and Night World, where Jack is a major character. You know, I read Night World without having read his standalone novel. Um, then later, I remember picking up a copy, a, a paperback copy of Legacies at a bookstore. This must have been in like early 99 before the third novel came out, because I remember getting that in. Uh, hardback. And at some point, I remember getting the tomb around the same time. Okay, so I'll see you in two weeks. Four weeks, if you want to wait for the next book. I know this this has been a little bit shorter than I wanted, but I am just... I, I'm getting into the swing of recording. So hopefully these, these will get longer or maybe a little more focused. I don't know. Uh, until then, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me at quietofthenightpodcast at gmail.com. I have been your host, Gillian. This has been the Quiet of the Night Podcast. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.